All right, and we are ready to get started. Today we are going to be doing uh, Moren of uh, Section 1, Chapter 38. And uh, it's, a, it's a relatively short chapter, but in the course of doing this very short chapter, we're going to be going back a little bit to uh, last week's chapter, Chapter 37, which was a little bit lengthier, and we went through it a little bit faster than what I would have liked. And I'd like to clarify a couple of things from last chapter, which really is a companion. Uh, really, the thir- chapter 37 and 38 are really two bookends of the same topic, which is talking about the word panim, which was last chapter, and the word achor, which is this chapter. Panim and achor are sort of the two opposite words. Panim means in front, and achor means in back. Panim means face, achor means the back of a person's body, where you don't really see anything distinguishable about the individual. Panim is where you see much more of the features and the identity of the individual, and achor, which is where you only see the back, and you don't see uh, any of the identifiable features or the emotional responses of the individual. Um, we also learned in last week's uh, shiur on, in chapter 37 that the word panim can be used in multiple ways, six different definitions. The Rambam had given us to what the word uh, panim means, depending upon the prepositions that are placed in front of it, such as lifne and alpine, either in front of or before chronologically. Um, and here we're going to see a similar description in achor, although not as comprehensive. We're not going to see six definitions of the word achor, and again, because when you're in front of something, there's a greater richness of texture of understanding of the thing that you are in front of, whereas when you're in back of something, or uh, then you don't really get a full picture of what you're actually trying to uh, understand or comprehend. So let's take a look first at the short text of the chapter, and then we'll get into a little bit more about uh, what I want to be able to bring out both from last, the last chapter and the current chapter. Uh, I hope that you have, by now, the handout uh, for today's uh, for today's shiur. Um, if you don't have it, you can, uh, if you kindly open up another tab in your uh, Facebook browser, and you go to the Facebook group shiur in Moren Nevuchim, and you'll be able to see the handout for today, Moren Nevuchim, chapter thirty-eight, God's back and the debate on how much man can apprehend. Okay. So we're going to get to all of that. So let's look at the text. The word achor is an equivocal term. It means that it's used in different ways, in different contexts throughout Tanakh. It is a term to, denoting the back, the back of a, of a human being or of a creature or of an inanimate object. Thus, and here's an example of where it's describing the back of an object or of a structure, when there's a discussion in Exodus chapter 26 about the construction of, and the dimensions of the Mishkan of the tabernacle, Uh, the Torah writes that if you're you're, uh, creating these um, yiriot, these these walls that are going to be draping, and the ceiling that's going to be draping over using fabric and using animal skins that's going to be draping over the beams of the tabernacle, uh, there is an instruction of Tisrach al Achorei Hamishkan, you shall have some kind of, of lip or or um, additional fabric that goes over the back of the Mishkan. So you see, it's descriptive of the back of a structure. Next, the spear came out at his back. This is a story having to do with a violent act that was committed by Avner. Uh, who is a biblical figure in the book of Shmuel, killing another person named Asael. Not important to go into the story right now, but the scripture writes, Vateitse hachanit me'acharav vayipol sham vayamot tachtav, that the spear that Avner struck uh, struck the victim with went out from his front into through his back. And so it's descriptive of the back of a human being. Uh, sometimes it is used as an adverb of time in the sense of after, just like lifne is used chronologically, achare, which is its opposite, uses is used chronologically as well. So, for example, 
neither at the back of him arose there any like him, um, which is a, a book, a, a verse in the book of Melachim Bet, which is referring to the reign of King Josiah, King Yoshiahu, where the scripture is describing the great rehabilitation that he set about to create within the Jewish kingdom to eradicate all idolatry. And there the verse says that um, lo melech, there was never a king before him that returned to God with all of his might. And at the end of the Pasuk it says, Ve'acharav lo kam kamohu, and there was no one after him. So chronologically it's used. And again, another example at the back of these things or after these events, which is in Parshat Lech Lecha in the, in the Chumash, Achar HaDevarim HaEle Haya Devar Hashem El Avram Bamachazel Eimor. After these events, after the certain events that had taken place in the life of Avraham, God appeared to him in a vision saying, and this is the precursor to the Brit Bein HaBitarim, a certain covenant that God made with Avram. Okay, another Example. This use is frequent. The term is also oh, the term also occurs in the meaning of following and imitating the conduct of some individual with, with respect to the conduct of life. So when Scripture wants to tell you go after someone or go after something, it means be imitative or comport yourself in the way of that other thing. If it says B should go achare a it doesn't mean that it should go chronologically after a, a in all cases, but it could mean that B should emulate A in some way. To follow them, right? Walk this way can mean just walk, uh, follow me, or it could also mean walk the way I'm walking, right? Depending upon the context. There's an old joke like that. But in any event, so therefore the, the Torah says, Acharei Hashem Elokechem Telechu. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 13. It says, walk following the Lord your God. In other words, follow in God's ways. Uh, emulate God in certain ways. And as the Talmud says, mahu rachum afata rachum, that just like God is merciful, so shall you be merciful. Just like God is benevolent, so shall you be benevolent, and so forth. Um, they shall walk at the back of the Lord. Um, this is a, a verse in the book of Hosea, um, that referring to the people of Ephraim, who even though they have turned away from God, but Hashem yishag, but eventually they will follow the ways of the Lord and they will roar like a lion, which means following in obedience to Him and imitating His acts and conducting life in accordance with His conduct. And again, another verse again from the book of Hosea. Um, but here it's referring to the Jewish people in a negative way, whereas the previous verse from Hosea chapter 11 referred to the tribe of Ephraim or the, or the segment of the Jews from Ephraim as returning and following in God's ways. Here the verse in Hosea chapter 5 refers to the people of Ephraim as kihoil halach acharetzav, sadly they have tragically followed in the ways of an idolatrous God and therefore they are going to be oppressed as a result. In this sense it is said, and thou shalt see my back. So now we really get to the main event of this chapter, which are these last few lines of the chapter. Again, as I said, it's a very short chapter. Now, when we talk about following God, or going in the ways of God, it is in this sense that it says that you shall see my back, which means that you will apprehend what follows me, has come to be like me, and follows necessarily from my will. That is, all the things created by me, as I shall explain in a chapter of this treatise. And that's it. That's the end of the chapter. And basically, what the Rambam is doing is that he's going back to the passage in Exodus chapter 32, which he had dwelled upon in uh, the previous chapter. And really, in order for us to understand this properly, we have to go back to the previous chapter where the Rambam set out to discuss the different word, different meanings of the word panim, of, of face. Because uh, God, in his description to Moshe, God had said to Moshe, V'ra'ita et achorai, ufanai lo yira'u. You will see my back, but my face cannot be seen. Now, uh, 
in order to understand this more fully, the Rambam says, I will explain this in a chapter of this treatise. What he is referring to is later on in chapter 54 of this very same section. So in chapter 54, and I actually have uh, the text of the relevant section of chapter 54 that I wanted to show you from the Pines edition. It's on page 124, if you'd like to follow along in your own Pines edition of this text. We're going to come into the middle of chapter 54. It's a bit more, it's a bit of a lengthy chapter. Um, And I just want to set this up for you. According to the Rambam, Moshe Rabbeinu had made two requests of God uh, in addition to asking God to forgive the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf, which is the uh, which is where this uh, events these events take place, this interchange between Moshe and God, and Moshe had asked God for two things. The first one was in chapter thirty sorry chapter thirty three, verse thirteen. Moshe had said, "Hodi na et derachecha." God, please show me your way. That was the first request. And the second request is in verse 18, Vayomar har na et kivodecha. Moshe asks God, show me your glory. So, teach me your way and show me your, your glory. Two separate requests. The Rambam's interpretation of these two requests is that the first request was granted to Moshe, but the second was not. The first request is, God, I want to be able to understand how I can find you in all of your manifestations in the world you created, in your creations. The second request, Har'eni na'et kivodecha, was to show me your true essence. I want to be able to understand the essential God not the God of creation or how God manifests himself among his creation, but I want to understand your innate existence. And to that, God had said, That's, that request goes too far. I can grant you your first request. And the way that God granted Moshe's first request was by teaching him his 13 attributes of mercy. Because essentially what God was telling Moshe is that you will be able to look out through all of that exists, And you will be able to find a sort of unitary theme throughout all of existence, which can be broken down in these 13 attributes of mercy that I'm going to teach you. But as far as your second request, that you want to understand the innate essence of God, You can only see my back, you cannot see my front. And here the Rambam says, the word back, or achorai, is essentially the same thing as that which follows from God, or that which is emulative of God, or imitative of God, which is the things that God creates in the world. God was essentially telling Moshe, you can only understand me through the things that I have created. There is no way for you to understand the essential God. And therefore, if we read from the text of the Mor Nebuchim itself, we read as follows. When Moshe asked for knowledge of the attributes and asked for forgiveness for the nation, he was given a favorable answer with regard to their being forgiven. But then he asked for the apprehension of his essence, may he be exalted. This is what he means when he says, Har na et kivodecha, show me, I pray, I pray thee, your glory. Whereupon he received a favorable answer with regard to what he had asked for first, namely, Uh, show me thy ways for he was told I will make all my goodness pass before you but in answer to his second question or a second demand he was told thou cannot cannot see my face and so on now if we look at the entire pasuk or the entire uh, context God says to Moshe as follows when Moshe had asked for the first request, God says to him in verse 19, Vayomer ani a'avir kol tu vi al panecha. God said, I will pass all of my goodness over your face, Moshe, v'karati b'shem Hashem lefanecha. And I will call out in the name of God, meaning I will teach you my 13 attributes which start with the name of Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum, V'chanun, etc. 
and I will teach you how I will be benevolent to whom I shall be benevolent, and I shall be merciful to whom I shall be merciful. However, at the second request, God says in verse 23, no, that the Rambam understands the words in verse 19 of Ani Avir Koltuvi Al Panecha, I will pass all my goodness in front of you, Moshe. What does that mean? He says, All my goodness alludes to the display of him to him of all the existing things of which it is said, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold it was very good. What that means is God says, I will show you all of creation and how it all relates to the unitary God, and everything is unified. Because why is that called all my goodness? Because the word tov is the most uh, important word to describe all of creation. If you take a look at the end of the six days of creation, vayar elokim et kol asher asa, that God beheld all that he had made, vihine tov me'od, and behold, it was very good. So the Rambam says that when God told Moshe, I will show you all my goodness, it means I will show you all of the tov ma'od, I will show you all of the greatness of creation that I created in the six days, and I will show you how all of that relates back to me. By their display, I mean that he will apprehend their nature and the way that they are mutually connected so that he, he will know how God governs them in general and in detail. But the second request, which is not to see God in creation, but to see God in his essential state, in his innate state, that request is denied to Moshe, and in that way God says, You can only see the things that result from me, which is my creation, but you cannot see my essential state. Now, I just want to point out, now that we've seen this text, and this is really what the Rambam is explaining, I want us to go back to a section that we saw on page 86 from chapter 37, where the Rambam had cited the explanation of Onkelos. And it's a little bit of a subtle point, but it's a very important point where we need to see that there is a departure in interpretation between Onkelos and the Rambam. Now, you know that the Rambam has tremendous deference for Onkelos and a great amount of appreciation for the project of Onkelos, which the Rambam had described. What is Onkelos's project? His project is that he removes any anthropomorphic qualities from God. Any time that the Torah describes any kind of uh, phrase or verb or action describing a corporeal kind of association to God, Onkelos takes the translation that he does from Hebrew to Aramaic and turns it a little bit, switches it a little bit so that you understand that these are borrowed terms, they are not to be taken literally, and the Rambam says, Shkoyach Onkelos, that's a great thing that you're doing. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Rambam always agrees with the conclusions that Onkelos makes. And we had seen this before, that even though the Rambam is appreciative of the way that Onkelos manipulates the text to remove any corporeality from God, there are times when he understands the verse differently. This is, an, this is one of those examples. Onkelos, that he had cited in, in the previous chapter, translates the words you will see my back, but you will not see my 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 front cannot be seen. He said, yat de batrai, u de kadamai lo yitchazun. You will only see those things that I have turned away from, said Onkelos, but you will not see those things which are right in front of me. And if you recall from the previous chapter, he says that uh, he means that the beings from which I have, as it were, turned away and upon which, speaking in parables, I have turned my back because of their remoteness from the existence of God, may he be exalted. Onkelos went so far as to say that God was denying Moshe not only a glimpse of God's innate existence, but God was also denying to mankind, represented by Moses, the ability for a human being to be able to even comprehend those created things which emanate from God but are too lofty for man's intellect. And what essentially Onkelos is suggesting is that there are things that are part of the physical world which man can comprehend, but there are aspects to the metaphysical world, such as angels, 
such as the uh, what we call the intelligences of the of the of the celestial spheres, which in Neoplatonic and Aristotelian philosophy refers to a certain sentience which exists in disembodied creations of God that are non totally non-physical, but are part of this process of filtering or causing God's emanation to come into our world and to tra- and to sort of transmute the non-corporeal God into a physical creation. And according to uh, Neoplatonism, it's not just that these celestial fears, spheres act as filters to bring God's emanation into the world, but each sphere is its own sentience, is its own intelligence that is aware and active and thinking and understands what it is doing, what it is in control of by bringing God's emanation from a completely transcendent realm and bringing it down into this world. And Uncleus' understanding is that God, in, in, in what, what, what God was telling Moshe was not only that you will not see me, but you will not even see those things that are in front of me, the things that I have created which are so close to me in their nature because of their non-corporeality, because of their transcendent nature. Those things too you will never be able to see or understand. And that is the area of dispute between the Rambam and Uncleus. The Rambam disagrees, and he, and he is of the belief that man is capable of comprehending those things that are completely non-physical and transcendent that are part of the metaphysical realm. And, uh, and that's the reason why he, he reworks those words. Instead of learning like Onkelos, which is that you will not see those things that are in front of me, he says that the word ufanai lo yerau means you will not see my true essence. But it's got nothing to do with the things that I've created. Anything that is acharai, anything that is behind me, God says, doesn't mean the things that I am distant from, but rather means the things that emanate from me. And that is inclusive of all of creation. Not just the things that are remotely created by God, such as anything within our corporeal physical realm, but even those things that are transcendent creation, such as angelic beings that are described in the book of Yechezkel and in the book of Zechariah, and the intelligences of the concentric spheres that are described in Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism, all of those things, God says, that you are capable of comprehending. And this is a very subtle point, and I know perhaps it does, it's not, doesn't make a big difference in the larger scheme of things in the writings of the Rambam, but it is very important to underscore this point. Remember, the Rambam set out to write the Moren of Uchim primarily, or at least one of the major objectives of Moren of Uchim, is to explain these two terms that are cited in the Mishnah in Chagiga, which is Ma'ase Vereshit and Ma'ase Merkava, to explain the act of creation, how God created the world on some level, try to understand what existed before creation and what changed as a result of creation and that creation process, that's what the Rambam had said is known as physics in Greek philosophy. But then the Mishnah used the second term, which is Ma'ase Merkava, which is an even more esoteric topic of discussion, a more mysterious, otherworldly discussion, which is the Rambam's, uh, Rambam associates with metaphysics in Greek philosophy. And that is a discussion of all that exists above and outside of the physical realm. To try and understand God's entourage in heaven. To try and make sense of the way that God connects with our world using a process that is described in Neoplatonism of these concentric spheres, uh, each one containing its own intelligence. And as such, because the Rambam understands that this is part of man's directive to completely attach oneself to God through understanding all of God's creations, he has to disagree with Uncleus. Because Uncleus' whole point is that man's ability to understand God's world is limited to the physical realm. Whereas according to the Rambam, that's not true. Man's ability of comprehension and apprehension is only limited to not understanding the true essence of our creator, of God himself. But within the framework of everything else that God has created, 
everything that God has created is not only comprehensible to man, but it is man's obligation to try to the best of his ability to try and comprehend everything that God has created, not only within the physical realm, but within the metaphysical realm as well. And if a human being were to fall short and only limit himself to the physical realm and not reach farther and not try to dig deeper into the metaphysical realm, then he would fail in his basic responsibility to try and attach himself intellectually to God to the greatest degree possible. And that's, and that's why the Rambam has to disagree with Uncleus, because Uncleus apparently in his efforts at distancing any kind of corporeal existence from God also distances perhaps God too much for the Rambam's tastes, because not only is God distanced from man, but even God's celestial realm is distanced from man and man's ability to understand it. The Rambam is not prepared to go that far. The Rambam feels that, to the contrary, it's man's obligation to understand what we call the sechalim nivdalim, all of these transcendent intelligences, and really make sense of the entire transcendent realm. All right, that's the that's the uh, the point that I wanted to get across today, is that really, um, and and we'll continue along this discussion. But just please make a note of this. This is an important uh, uh, point that I think needs to be underscored is that while the Rambam acknowledges that God himself, man is limited to, God, to, to access to, to God himself, but man is unlimited in his ability to access all of the things that exist outside of God, including the most esoteric and sublime of creations. Okay, and that's where we'll hold it for today. I just want to wish you all a good day, Chodesh Tov, and we'll pick this up, Ezrat Hashem, next week. Take care.